Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, an update on the controversial tribal casino being built near Glendale. We'll hear about a new project that connects nonprofits with funding sources and it's National Pet Week. We'll discuss responsible pet ownership. Most next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The U.S. Senate Indian Affairs Committee recently passed a bill that would block a new casino already under construction next to Glendale. For an update on the casino's legal status, we're joined by Robert Clinton, a foundation professor at ASU's Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining you. Great us. Great to be here. Uh, what is the status of this casino? Well, the casino is in a very complex situation. Uh, there's been litigation going on through two rounds with an appeal presently pending in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit um, about whether the construction, well, not so much the construction, the gaming on, in the casino is lawful. Additionally, there's been attempts at legislative amendment of the underlying act that's the basis of the claim that they can build the casino. And uh, that statute passed out of the Indian Affairs uh, Committee on April 29th. It's awaiting uh, full Senate action. There's a similar a bill pending in the House of Representatives, which has a number of supporters, including four members of the Arizona delegation. Um, so it's basically a race to see whether the casino is first constructed and opens, or whether Congress acts, or whether the courts act. Now, the tribe does have legal go-ahead to build, correct? They don't need legal go-ahead to build. Okay, because uh, it's all their they property. Need, uh, it's their property, they own it. Um, the land has been taken in trust pursuant to the first round of litigation, um, and uh, that just means they can build whatever they want on it. It doesn't mean they can open it, and it doesn't mean they can game on it. And I want to get, yeah, I want to get to that. Because the limitation is on operating the gaming facility. Exactly. I want to get to that in a second because we've already heard the governor and state gaming director say we're not going to let you open. But before we get there, you mentioned the two, uh, the, the two bills in the House and Senate. John McCain uh, says that what the tribe is doing, the Tohono O'odham tribe, uh, is doing is violating the intent of the Indian Gaming Act. And he says he should know he helped write the act, if not write it all himself, et cetera. It's a valid argument? Well, he definitely was involved in the drafting of the act. There's no question about that. There's a provision in the act, section 20 of the act, that was designed to prevent gaming on Indian lands acquired after the effective date of the act, which is back in 1988. And this land is definitely acquired after that date. There are a number of structured exceptions in that section, which of course he helped write. And what the tribe is claiming is that one of those exceptions, the settlement of an Indian land claim exception, mm -hmm. um, covers their situation. Uh, obviously, Senator McCain thinks it doesn't cover that situation. He's been joined by Senator Flake in that respect, who's also co-sponsoring the bill. Um, I think it's a very interesting question whether that section does or does not cover the situation. Right now, Judge Campbell of the district court has ruled that it does cover uh, the TO situation and that the gaming therefore would be lawful. That is part of what's on appeal to the United States Court of Appeals of the Ninth Circuit. And again, this is all happening because the tribe got money as part of this settlement, as you mentioned, for tribal land that was flooded due to a dam. Precisely. And that settlement was way back in the 1980s. They were authorized to buy at least three parcels. This is the last parcel. All right. Arizona, the state of Arizona says the tribe committed fraud because they did not tell of their casino plans when the compact was being negotiated. Is that valid? Well, oftentimes fraud happens because of misrepresentation, not failure to disclose. Uh, there's no apparent misrepresentation that T.O. made that Arizona seems to be arguing for. And usually we don't find fraud where there's just a failure to disclose. And this is a failure to disclose. Furthermore, the fact that um, T.O. had the ability to buy parcels of land um, was public knowledge. It was part of a public act. Uh, the fact that Arizona didn't discover that they might in fact buy such land is in part Arizona's uh, problem. Also, the compacts themselves, when you look at them, just say that the gaming has to be on Indian land, and this is Indian land, and that it has to be in compliance with the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And if it is 
land acquired after the effective date, it has to be in conformity with that Section 20 I was talking about. And Judge Campbell has ruled that it is in conformity with Section 20, though I have some doubts about that. I was going to say, it sounds as though you're not quite convinced that Judge Campbell made the right ruling. Well, the way Section 20 reads, if you just look at the statute, it would seem that it's a settlement of the land claim. But there have been regulations under that statute that the uh, Gaming Commission uh, has, uh, has uh, promulgated. And they go way back. And those regulations define what the settlement of a land claim is. And they basically require sort of a number of things, but one of them being that the title to the land or possession to the land had to have been at issue in the dispute and that the opposing party had to have claimed an adverse title or possession. The United States was never claiming title or right. possession of that land. Right. Judge Campbell's ruling ignored the second part of the definition. He just looked at the first part. And by looking only at the first part, he came to the conclusion that possession was at issue. Is the state arguing the wrong things? Uh, the state has been arguing the wrong things since this litigation started. They first argued that the land couldn't be taken in trust when the act mandated the secretary to take it in trust. In other words, there's no discretion. He had to take it in trust. So having the state argue that uh, it shouldn't lawfully be taken in trust was a misplaced use of funds. And now they're focusing on fraud and misrepresentation in the negotiations. And as I look at the Prop 202 literature, the Prop 202 um, statements, um, everything seems to be consistent with um, what T.O. is saying. The point being that what they should be focusing on, and should have been from the beginning, is whether or not this is within the exception in Section 20 which I've always thought would determine whether this casino ever opened. With that in mind, the governor says the casino will not open. State gaming director says the casino will not open. Can the state keep this thing from opening? The state has an obligation to perform its duties under the existing compact. Some of those duties include um, uh, reviewing tribal licensing decisions. If the state breaches that compact, a number of things can happen. Arbitration can happen. The flow of money to the state from the casinos, including the flow from TO's existing casinos, mm -hmm. can be disrupted. A number of adverse consequences can occur if the state follows through with its threat. Um, so I kind of think it's a bit of an idle threat if TO wins the litigation. But if the Tohono O'odham TO, if they open this casino, Critics argue it blows the gaming compact wide open and all things are open now for renegotiation. Is that valid? Not at all. Not at all? Not at all. The, the, this is a unique situation related to a unique land claim settlement that probably if Judge Campbell's interpretation of a settlement of a land claim is accepted, brings this case within a very narrow exception there would be no other situation like it that I can imagine in the state, and it's in conformity if you accept Judge Campbell's interpretation with the compacts. Last question on this. If the tribe is not allowed or the state somehow prohibits the tribe from opening the casino, can they sue? Can they sue for damages? Are we going to start paying for gambling losses here, well, essentially? Well, essentially, um, preventing the casino from opening at most creates a kind of speculative damage. Yes. You don't know right. what the damages would have been. I'd be very, very surprised if the state would be on the hook for those kinds of damages, and I don't think there's a risk exposure there. A scale of 1 to 10, 0 meaning it ain't opening. 10 meaning there's no doubt it's opening. Where do we stand? Uh, before the district court, I would have said four. After the district court ruling, I would say six. But it's not a slam dunk. It's very close to five on both sides, isn't it? Good to have you here. Thanks nice for joining Nice to be here. Thank you for having me.
Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at an effort to connect nonprofits looking for funding with corporations looking for nonprofits to fund. The Clearinghouse is called the Grant Network, and it's a joint effort between ASU's Lodestar Center for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Innovation and Valley Leadership. Here to tell us more about all this is Julia Patrick, founder and CEO of the Arizona Nonprofit Academy, and Nicole Alman Anderson, marketing manager of ASU Lodestar. Good to have you both here. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Thanks, Ted. Let's get some. Let's define some terms here. What is the grant network? You know, it's really interesting. We have about a little over 20,000 nonprofits serving our state. And every second that a nonprofit spends trying to find money through finding grants or opportunities there, and that's time that's taken away from their serving their mission. And so as part of Valley Leadership, um, in conjunction with ASU Lodestar, we came together and decided that we would start a forum, an online portal, where grants, grantors, and nonprofits could go and learn about what's out there and what's available. And ASU Lodestar obviously involved here. What is yes. ASU Lodestar? How'd you get involved? So yes, the ASU Lodestar Center really helps build the capacity of the nonprofit sector both here in the Valley and throughout the greater Southwest. We offer um, online trainings and in-person trainings, but one facet of what we do has always been serving the community, and part of that is through philanthropy and access to grant funding. Um, the, uh, the grant network really spawned from an original platform called AZ Gates, and that started way back in the day um, when the center was first founded in 1999. And through the years, it's needed some updating. So through Valley Leadership's Class 36 and our group of uh, Matthew Whitaker and Richie Wessel and um, Jeff Stapleton and Julia uh, Bogan and um, Gary, Trujillo. Gary Trujillo, of course, and us, we've decided to take on AZ Gates and give it a new name and refresh it make it more uh, fitting for this year's uh, uh, nonprofit organization and through the philanthropy side. So, I'm a nonprofit. I'm looking for help here. I need some funding it. and <clears throat> I know there are corporations out there, but I do not know how to connect. Right. I hear about the grant network. How does it work? It's really a fabulous opportunity because what we're finding with nonprofits is that, you know, there's, there's no dearth of mission. You know, your nonprofit is probably at the heart and soul of what you do. But the reality is you might not know what corporations are going to align with you, right? Mm -hmm. And so what this does is that it gives our community an opportunity to find the right matches. So maybe we can build more sustainable funding opportunities for somebody. Perhaps we find a funder for your network or for your nonprofit that might last decades. We don't know. Interesting. So we want to really get almost, if you will, a matchmaker's kind of service. So I go to the portal and I say, uh, Ted's nonprofit, here's what I specialize in, here are my geographic areas, here's my history, Absolutely. here's my future outlook, and then, then what? So the, the bread and butter really of our site and what differentiates us from uh, other organizations that do similar uh, projects is that we will match you to an organization that could potentially fund your nonprofit. So say there's an organization that only wants to fund animals. They can go to our site and search by nonprofit that specializes in outreach to animals or education or children. And they'll get a comprehensive list and then they can fine tune uh, potential um, grant awards to those organizations. And it works vice versa on the flip side. If I'm a nonprofit organization that needs specific funding, I can search for uh, grantors that specialize in my area. And so I'm a corporation now. I've decided mm -hmm. to become a corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to fund some nonprofits. Right. I go to the portal and, and what information do I give? What's really interesting is that you can talk about that service area. So perhaps um, you're only you're bound by your your structure to only serve people in rural Arizona, mm -hmm. or perhaps you know Southern Arizona or Maricopa County. That will allow you a lot of time saved because one of the problems that we have in the nonprofit world is that people that are funding things have to say no a lot. It's oh. really hard, and so with with the grant network we're able to bring people together and put them into a, in a more comfortable situation and a more realistic situation that will allow them an opportunity to actually make a match. How had the two sides connected in the past? I mean, how, how did it, it's uh, shaking word, your head, yes. Really word of mouth <laughs> and yeah. who you know. It's yeah. hitting the pavement and, and establishing mm -hmm. those relationships with the grantors and that's why some uh, nonprofits are more successful than others. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we want every nonprofit organization to have access to the same amount of funding um, and it will only help build the capacity of our nonprofit community for the better.
And how long has now the grant network been around? So the grant network is it's really exciting. It, uh, we started working on this project in fall, and as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, we're just opening up the site now, and we are affording a grant that has been sponsored um, by Blue Cross and Blue Shield for a thousand dollars. We're going to pick some Valley non or Arizona nonprofit that comes to our site and puts their profile information in, and they will get a thousand dollars to help kickstart this off. Pretty and, awesome. Uh, it just sounds pretty Ted's, awesome. Ted's, Ted's nonprofit I, I, might I, I, have to sign up. The wheels are spinning already, and they're, <laughs> yeah. they're not spinning clearly. You have to be a registered 501c3 uh, well, person. Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> what kind of reaction are you getting from this idea? Oh, it's it's taken off. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, just social media today, we've been blitzing about it, and it's it's hitting it's hitting everywhere right now. Um, and and what's great is that the smaller nonprofits have access to the same amount. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So where do nonprofits and corporations go to get more information? Grantnetwork.org. Yeah. And they can look through. Um, ultimately, it will be a massive directory. But right now, they can help us by inputting their information. And it's, mm -hmm. it's very easy to participate. Um, it's basically gathering a lot of information. You can just click on you know, the, the different fields that are asked and, and then mm -hmm. let us do the rest. And the bottom line is for nonprofits, funding really is the, the, the touchstone, isn't it? I mean, completely, it's completely. I mean, that's without our sector, we wouldn't have the community that we have today. So we want these nonprofits to live to see another day. All right, that website one more time. Grantnetwork.org. All right, grantnetwork.org. Good to have you both here. Thank Thanks you. for joining Thank us. You. This is National Pet Week, a paw print on the calendar created by the American Veterinary Medical Association. National Pet Week is designed to celebrate pets and promote responsible pet ownership. Here now is veterinarian William Griswold, Director of Medical Management at the Emergency Animal Clinic in Gilbert. Good to have you here. Same here. Thank you. National Pet Week, what are we talking about here? Well, it's an event that was started back in the early 80s by the American Veterinary Medical Association to promote uh, responsible pet care and also celebrate the benefits that pets provide in, in our lives. The good things that pets All are. the good things, uh, yep. Responsible pet ownership, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Well, it means a number of things, and it goes beyond just basics of food and shelter. Um, the AVMA on their website, avma.org, has a great list of um, what they consider guidelines for responsi responsible pet ownership, but they include things like commitment, um, both in terms of choosing wisely, not making um, impulsive decisions when we get a pet, um, but also for committing to the life. Um, the life's duration of, the pet, of any pet that we take on as well. Um, investment of both time and money to provide the things that they need, including, of course, food and shelter, but also appropriate training, medical care, and also budgeting for an emergency. Mm. Um, and then finally, preparedness, um, whether it's for disasters, say a forest fire, and you know what to do with our pets if we have to evacuate our homes, um, or in the event that we can no longer take care of them. And also looking down the line for as their quality of life begins to decline and preparing for mm. um, providing them um, with what they need at the end yeah, of life as yeah. well. I think we've all been through that. Now, it, obviously, finding a vet, you're a vet, you know how important it is to get these things, these little creatures in there. How, do you, how best do you find a vet, and uh, it, how best do you vet a vet? The best way um, I find is to ask friends and relatives, um, particularly people who feel the same way about their pets as you do. 
Um, you know, it's one thing if you're crazy about your pets and you ask your neighbor who's just got a backyard dog, you know, what veterinarian they would recommend. But if you can find a family member that shares that same sort of bond with their pets, um, a word of mouth referral is one of the best ways to go. The Emergency Animal Clinic has a list of general practice veterinarians that we partner with um, to provide after hours emergency care for their cases. Um, that people can go to our website and get a, a list of veterinarians throughout the valley. Um, who are uh, engaged with the emergency animal clinic as well. As a veterinarian, let's get back to National Pet Week here, yeah. kind of this stuff. As a veterinarian, do you see differences between dog owners and cat owners? Not so much. You don't? Um, I, I own both, so maybe they're not as pronounced. The differences aren't as pronounced to me. Um, but there are, there can definitely be differences, I think, between the, um, you know, it, true cat lovers or only you know those, those folks who prefer cats over dogs and vice versa. Dog owners tend to be a little bit maybe more outgoing and louder, kind of like that Labrador puppy <laughs> crashing, <laughs> yeah. crashing through the gate. But I'd read that, that cat, your vets are less likely to see cats on a regular basis than they are dogs. Yes, that is sadly true. Um, cats are the most popular pet by numbers anyways in the United States these days. And uh, only 20 to 30 percent of veterinary visits are made up of um, by cats. Well, I can tell you one reason why folks probably don't take their cats to the vets quite as often. It's it's a it's a disaster scene in the vehicle when you're trying to drive that cat to the vet. How do you how do you what can you do to make that less stressful? Well, there are a number of things that you can do. The easiest with cats, or the best with cats, is to get them used to the carrier before you need it. Mm -hmm. And so things as simple as feeding them in their carriers, providing a bed um, or a comfortable resting place within the carrier. A lot of cats prefer the soft-sided kind of duffel bag style over the, the hard plastic carriers. Um, and oddly enough, the smaller the carrier, the more comfortable a lot of cats are. They feel kind of like safe and enclosed in a small space, so they may be less stressed in a smaller carrier than they are in a larger one. And as far as dogs are concerned, along with cats, but, but for both, uh, for all pets, well, with dogs and cats specifically, uh, spaying, neutering, how important? Critically important, particularly for reducing pet overpopulation. Um, there also are several health benefits, um, ranging from reducing certain types of cancers to eliminating unwanted behaviors in both cats and dogs of both sexes um, associated with surgical sterilization. So uh, what, what, what side do you fall on on the spay and, and release, the neuter and release ideas? That is a really tough uh, problem. There are, like you said, two two sides. Yes. Um, there are, you know, on, on the one hand, the cat proponents, and on the other hand, to some extent, environmental proponents, um, striking a balance between the needs of native wildlife and uh, you know the, the overwhelming number of, of stray and feral cats in America is a yeah. real challenge. So you're basically right there in the middle. Yeah. Well, there. I think there is evidence to support both positions, and that's where the real challenge runs in. It's it's very easy for both sides of the matter to mount a, a compelling argument. I'd read that. Uh, I looked at pet friendly states. Arizona is not in the top ten for the most pet friendly. Not in the top ten for the least pet friendly. Uh, what do you make of all that? Uh, no, I would say it's a pretty pet friendly place, particularly dog friendly with our walled subdivisions and um, you know everybody's got a fence around or a wall around their yard. Um, generally speaking, particularly the Metro Phoenix area, there are a lot of businesses that welcome pets, even restaurants with dog friendly patios and that sort of thing. But yet, and yet in the summertime, we know that you got to watch your pets. In um, the wintertime, there are days, nights I should say, when you got to watch your pets. It, you, do you see a lot of that? Do you still see a lot of that? Not so much in the winter, um, because even our coldest nights, most dogs you know, can, can huddle up and stay warm. But during the summer, and actually more so even during this part of the year, where the days are moderate but heating up, is where we tend to see a lot of exertional heat stroke. Um, just like with, with children, we can see dogs that get accidentally left in cars any time of year. Um, but during the early part of the summer and also during the initiation of the monsoon when the humidity spikes, we start to see increased numbers of cases of heat stroke in the emergency rooms because the dogs just aren't prepared for those environmental changes and haven't had a chance to get used to it. I think humans have that problem as well. They you, probably you don't realize do. how warm it is and how, much, how long, much longer the sun is out than it used to be. Right. All right. Well, congratulations on being a successful veterinarian, taking care of our little furry friends, and uh, we'll continue to celebrate National Pet Week. Great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we will have a state and national economic update, and we'll hear about a traditional European folk dance. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona 
Horizon. For more information on tonight's show, if you want to watch it again, see previous programs or check what we have on the future, azpbs.org slash horizon. That's where you can find us, azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.